On August 5th, 2019, India made an announcement that sent shockwaves around the globe. उस दिन से अनुच्छेद 370 के सभी खंड लागू नहीं होंगे. The move stripped away Indian administered Kashmir's special autonomy. At stake was the future of one of the world's most disputed regions. It's a huge surprise. A significant move to take direct control of the state of Kashmir. Troops, uh, as we understand it, out on the streets. Panic has gripped many local residents. If I were to sum up August 5th in one line, I would say that it has laid foundation for another decade of conflict. So how is the decision on Article 370 reshaping the region? Let us unpack that for you. Kashmir has been a major international story for decades, and the region's location makes it clear why. It's situated in the northernmost part of the Indian subcontinent, with China, India, and Pakistan all controlling parts of it. India and Pakistan both nuclear powers claim the territory in its entirety. However, we're going to focus on this part, the Indian administered area. What Article 370 of India's constitution did is give it, India's only Muslim majority state, a special semi-autonomous status. Indian administered Kashmir had its own flag, legislative assembly, and chief minister. Related articles forbade outsiders to settle in, buy land, hold local government jobs, or win scholarships in Indian administered Kashmir. Meant that Kashmir is for Kashmiris. So thinking about Article 370 and the reason it existed, we can say to recognize the nationalism of Kashmiri people. And that struggle to have Kashmiri nationalism recognized has deep historical roots. Under British rule, the entire region was known as the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. It had a Muslim-majority population and a Hindu ruler. In 1947, colonial rule ended. But before the British left, they partitioned India into two countries, nominally secular, but Hindu-majority India and Muslim-majority Pakistan were born. several princely states were given the choice to join either country. The ruler of Jammu and Kashmir at the time, a man by the name of Hari Singh, ceded control to India. And in this area of the world, there appeared a threat to international peace. And soon the newly formed states of India and Pakistan went to war. What we now often refer to simply as the Kashmir conflict had begun. The United Nations intervened one year later, brokering a ceasefire that established the line that still divides India-controlled and Pakistan-controlled Kashmir today. Its resolution also called for a referendum on the status of all of Kashmir. Only the referendum never happened. India started calling the area it administers the state of Jammu and Kashmir, which had the special privileges afforded under Article 370. Even though those privileges were eroded in many ways over the decades, Article 370 still offered Kashmiris a critical legal standing in the eyes of the Indian government. So taking it away was a shock. When you promise people something, it they they, they, they hold on to it, and they're also waiting for the plebiscite that's going to happen with the option of independence. Nobody from Kashmir or Jammu was consulted before doing this decision. The government of India really took uh, the opinion of the governor, who is an appointee of the president of India, uh, as consent of 12 million people of Jammu and Kashmir. Delhi then divided Indian administered Kashmir into two separate territories directly under the central government's control. And one result of that has been subjecting it to the same property and residence laws as the rest of India. Kashmiri Muslims fear this could spell out the end of their Muslim majority in the region. 
we were to kind of list uh, three different fears that Kashmiris have, I would say demographic change, demographic change, demographic change, because that leads to everything. People out here are really convinced that the government of India is out there uh, to change the demography of the state. And the government hasn't really come out to deny these allegations or uh, to kind of, you know, put to rest the fears of the people. There are also fears that economic resources are being siphoned out of the region. What has happened is that the government contracts are going to people outside uh, the state. And that's really bringing in a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty and fear in the minds of businessmen as well. Because if you have a situation where the local people are not able to exercise or do their businesses in a right manner, when the outsiders come with deep pockets, a heavy investment with a lot of cash, uh, they're able to monopolize and throw locals out of the business. Meanwhile, Ending Article 370 has brought with it a serious clampdown on residents in Indian-administered Kashmir, where over half a million security personnel were already stationed. There was a region-wide internet blackout. It's still partially in place. Indian-administered Kashmir, meanwhile, remains in lockdown. All communication lines now suspended. No internet. Day and night. Curfew. During the lockdown, the United Nations Special Rapporteurs expressed grave concern over alleged excessive use of force, ill-treatment during arrests and detentions. Several local politicians were arrested, and some are seeing changes in attitudes on the ground. People, young people, I mean young political activists who are my friends, who showed a lot of, you know, hope, who, who, who were progressive, who wanted peace, today they're totally alienated and and have switched to a discourse which is totally separatist. They see a legitimacy uh, in the voice of separatists. They see a legitimacy in the voice of militants, which in my opinion uh, is going to be very dangerous. However, militant separatism is one of the key reasons why India's government says it took this step. <laughs> And many Indians share those concerns about violence. Indian administered Kashmir has seen a violent insurgency at least since 1987, when a disputed election fueled separatist sentiment. Hindu Kashmiris known as Pandits have been targeted by Islamist militants, causing their mass migration out of the territory. India has accused Pakistan of sponsoring insurgent attacks. There are 42,000 people that have been killed in Jammu and Kashmir because of terrorists operating with the support of a country to our west. And this doesn't get adequate attention. The terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir has always been a national security issue for the country and for any government in Delhi. This was particularly so in the 1990s during the height of militancy. Figure of something like a uh, little more than 4,000 odd terror incidents in 1990. It just goes to show how violent the conflict was. But after that, uh, troops were sent in, the army was sent in, and things started to be brought under control. So you had a period around 2012, 2014, when things reached their, when the number of incidents reached their lower hundreds. The violence was one reason why India's government says it revoked the region's former autonomy. Officials also claim its special status was preventing its development and integration with India. Article 370 provided shelter to all kinds of horrible things. Uh, it did not allow 106 Indian laws passed by Parliament and the Supreme Court's rulings to apply in Kashmir, including LGBTQ rights, including women's rights. But observers say revoking Article 370 was motivated by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's own political ambitions of being at the helm of a Hindu nationalist state. In fact, it was one of the main campaign promises of his party, the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party in 2019. Uh, here you have Narendra Modi, a strong man who is dealing with the problem of Kashmir, who is able to show to his support base and to the wider Indian population that look, here is India's only Muslim majority uh, state. They were being problematic and here we have sorted them out by removing Article 370 and hence now this state is a complete part, a 
completely integrated with the Union of India. Prime Minister Modi promised that this move would help end turmoil in Indian administered Kashmir and that it would usher in an era of economic development and stability. But for now, many residents say that this is not happening and that their dream of deciding on their future now seems more distant than ever. And what we have seen in the last few months, I do not really see a positive future uh, because after August 5th, the government really had a very, very small window of aggressively deploying its resources when it comes to development, infrastructure, you know, winning hearts and minds. That has not happened. But what has really happened one year after August 5th, the humiliation continues. We have come to a point where anyone who shows eyes to India is seen as a friend uh, or who shows eyes to the Narendra Modi government is seen as a friend. Uh, that's a very dangerous trend. Uh, that kind of, uh, you know, widespread anger and alienation I have not witnessed in my life.